It is the Blitz here on San Antonio Sports Star, ESPN AM 1250, 94.5 FM. I'm Jason Minnick. Glad to have you along here on a Monday afternoon after a long holiday weekend. Time for Mondays with the Moose. Three-time Super Bowl champion, Daryl Johnston, now with Fox Sports, joining us now. And, Daryl, man, I, I hope you had a great Thanksgiving uh, and the Cowboys game didn't uh, turn too much of uh, uh, your day into a bad one. <laughs> no, it was uh, it was a nice day. It was a nice day. Um, could have ended better, but uh, it was still uh, – Still enjoyable, frustrating. Uh, it, it's weird, even as a as a fan now. It's it's hard. It's hard to to watch games slip through your team's fingers. So, yeah, a little bit disappointing at the end. Yeah, it, it, well, and I look at this. This is one of the great because you, you played. You're an executive. You you call games on TV. Your knowledge, uh, especially with the Cowboys, is incredible. And you look at that game, and they've not now lost three or four. And we try not to blame officials too much, but you and I have talked this year about some officiating calls. But my goodness, that was a flag fest. So many people tuning in. That can't be what Roger Goodell and the TV executives want, is it? No, not at all. Not at all. And, and, and with a game like that, you want the officials to be out of that as, as much as possible. And and then you kind of you know you read into the to the history of the Sean Hockley crew. I think they're. Record was eight and two in favor of the road teams coming into that game. Um, I think they were number four in terms of of calling penalties. Um, so you'd like for them to stay out of it. And the hard part for me was, you know, at the game, you watch those pass interference calls, and you were getting really frustrated. And 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 I thought I was getting frustrated because uh, they didn't look egregious in real time but when you go back and you watch it in slow motion and i'm sure the fans at home watching on television you know probably got that from troy or from uh, from tony and jim uh as they were looking at it uh but when i went back and looked at it on film you know the the standard of the rule is there the, the one that was hard for me is, is the one you know in in uh in overtime um because you know I know they don't like to say this, but, you know, the standard of the rule goes up higher, you know, especially that position in the field, because you're, you're basically giving one of the teams an opportunity for a victory. And you never want the officials to, to play a role in that. Um, but, but even that one, you know, Anthony Brown, was, he, was, he was not getting his head around. He was not locating the football. If you get your head around and you're trying to locate the football, they'll allow you to have some of that contact, and especially on that last one. I mean, if he, just, if he gets his head around that, that the contact that is there, um, is, is going to be permissible, in my opinion, in that situation. So, you know, as it, upset as I was at the game in real time, when I went back and looked at it, I could justify it a little bit more. Uh, but, but still, it, it doesn't make anything better. The, the, the big one for me is if we're struggling in that situation with one-on-ones, if we're calling those types of defenses in situations on third down, uh, sometimes third and long, you know, maybe we need to just adjust the approach. So it'd be interesting to see, you know, what Dan Quinn does uh, against the Saints in, in that situation and, and maybe, you know, defends in a little different manner because Anthony Brown was struggling that day. And the one thing you want to do is is kind of help him out. And, and maybe all of a sudden, instead of back to the ball, we've got eyes on the quarterback in those situations and, and change it up a little bit. Yeah, because, I mean, you look at the Cowboys have now lost three of four. I don't think it's time to hit the panic button yet. But at the same time, I think it's fair to say Dak Prescott is in a bit of a slump. When your leader, when your quarterback is struggling, you know, his accuracy seems a little bit off. What do you do as a teammate or as a coaching staff to get your quarterback back on track? Because if he's on track, I think everything else runs smoothly. Yeah, I, I think the guys just have to start making some of the tougher catches. Uh, you know, the, the, the beginning of the season, you know, he was – he was playing like out and, and everything was easy. You know, the, the footballs were, you know, if, if, it, if it was a little off, it was back shoulder. It was a little out in front. Um, you know, it was down in the waist. Now we're, you know, we're down on the knees. We're, we're out in front and low, which is one of the more difficult catches. We're, we're a little bit too far behind where we've got to really kind of stop our momentum and make an adjustment there. So um, I, I think for the guys, just continue to focus on your craft. Uh, know that Dak is, is doing everything he can to work himself out of this slump um, and, and just take care of what your role is in the offense. And, and that is catching some difficult 
footballs that are thrown to you. And, and, and all of a sudden his confidence will start to build and, and he'll, that ball, the ball will be in a little bit better position on, on the, you know, later in the game. So, you know, focus on what you can concentrate on and, and what you can improve on and, and let Dak do the same because you know he's, he's doing everything he possibly can to work himself out of this little slump. When you think about uh, just the game on Thursday, on Thanksgiving, the 36-33 loss to the Raiders in overtime, you know, Zeke clearly doesn't look 100%, but as a team, they only ran it 20 times. Zeke had nine carries, Pollard had 10, yet he threw 47 pass attempts in a game that was relatively close. Because uh, Zeke's injury, I suppose, did, did they abandon the run too early? Do you kind of feel like they should have tried to stay committed to the run a little bit longer? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, trying to get our, our head coaching staff together for the USFL and just reaching out to all my contacts. I had a conversation with Dick Vermeil today, and and he honestly, this is amazing, Jason. He he had just broken this stat down uh, last week, and he did his his benchmark was forty, so he did forty plus pass attempts, and then thirty nine or fewer pass attempts, and he did quarterbacks records in those types of games. And, and there's very few quarterbacks, you know, in the NFL that are going to win a game when you're throwing the ball 40 plus times and, it, and it's, it's who you would think it's Mahomes, um, it, It's Brady, you know, it, it's guys that not only, you know, maybe the experience and the athleticism and the, and the supporting cast, but kind of that style of offense to it. It's how that team is built. If, if Dallas really wants to hearken back to the days when they were running the football and controlling the clock, uh, we, we've seen that work. We're watching San Francisco do it this year with, with Jimmy Garoppolo uh, to just lessen the burden. And as we're talking about Dak Prescott in that slump, you know, one of the things that, that maybe not the guys on the field can do to help him, but what Kellen Moore can do to help him is, is not take him up into the, into the forties, throwing the football, but, but that win loss percentage, once you go above 40 is, is dramatic for, for your normal quarterbacks. Uh, you know, it's just your elite guys that are in those systems where they're functioning, you know, kind of in a similar win loss percentage. So I, I, I absolutely agree with that. And, and, to add on to that right now, um, you know, I, you know, to, to see Ezekiel, you know, kind of fighting through this, uh, to know that, that, that he's a tough guy and wants to be on the field. Um, you know, th this was, I always thought it was a little bit more severe when it, when it first happened, it, it, it didn't look good to me when he, when he first did it. Um, you can tell it's, it, it's impacting him. I, I think right now you're leaning on Tony Pollard, you know, a little bit more and, and you let D get, or Zeke get healthy. Maybe, Maybe not even leaning on Tony, but but maybe you know he's a healthy scratch one game, and, and you bring Corey Clement in as, as your changeup. You know, it's it's a little bit different. It's not the physical style that Zeke has. It's more similar to Tony, but just to give him a little bit of time, you know, to kind of heal up as you're getting ready to get into this December push towards the playoffs. It's going to be interesting to see Thursday night Cowboys and Saints. Not a short week since it's Thursday to Thursday, but a lot of stuff going on there at the start that's making it a different week with uh, the COVID outbreak within the facility. Now Mike McCarthy is going to miss the game because he has tested positive. The fact that they're going Dan Quinn as the acting head coach as opposed to Jim Fossil, and I say that I thought it would be Fossil because special teams coach, let him do that. Let your offensive and defensive coordinator stay doing what they're doing. Are you surprised that they're going to bring Coach Quinn out of the booth and down on the sidelines to be the acting head coach Thursday? I think that's the big thing that he's coming out of the booth down to the sideline. And, and it was one of the things that I had talked to, to Coach Quinn about in preseason. And, you know, he referenced, you know, back to Pete Carroll, you know, when, when he made that transition as a defensive coordinator. Um, and he just said the vision from above, you see it more, you, you can anticipate things, you're much better on your next snap. Um, you just seem to be at a better pace when you're, when you're seeing everything from up above, you know, down on the sideline, you have the interaction with the players and, and you can look into their eyes and you can kind of see how they're doing. But uh, I, I think that also distracts from your ability to, to stay ahead of the snap. So I think that that'll be the biggest challenge for, for Dan Quinn coming down to the sideline uh, to be the head coach and controlling all three phases of the game um, is it's just going to be a different perspective from him as the coordinator. Uh, I think because of his, his, experience in the past and being comfortable with it and having done it for a long time. Um, I, I think that that's probably why Mike leans that way. Uh, if he doesn't have somebody like Dan Quinn as his defensive coordinator in that position, it probably does go to John Fossil. Um, you, you see a lot of coaches do that. I mean, you see Rich Passaccia is the interim head coach with the Raiders now uh, as a special teams head coach. 
Um, so that that's definitely you know something that happens in the NFL. But I just think Dan's experience that he's had as a head coach uh, down in Atlanta uh, it, is going to be the the difference in that decision. But I think the big question for Dan is going to be how comfortable is he down there now? You know, after 12 weeks of being up in the booth, calling it from from a higher perspective. It's going to be interesting. Daryl Johnston, the Moose, joining us here on the Blitz. You look at uh, three or four losses. You got the Saints, Washington, New York, Washington, Arizona, Philadelphia to close out the season. Everything the Cowboys want is still very much in play, especially since the Eagles uh, just don't seem to want to make it an interesting NFC East race after they lost yesterday to the Giants. How do you how do you how do you rally the troops and turn things around? It, 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 on the outside, it looks like man, the, the, oh, you know, it's not panic button time yet, but we're getting close to that. What's it like in that locker room right now with the guys as they look at the upcoming schedule that, uh, you know, as we hit December? Yeah, it, it's, it's strange, but a lot of it becomes kind of football cliche, Jason. Um, you know, and, and you hit on one of the big ones right there is, you know, it's not time to push the panic button. Everything we wanted to accomplish this season is still within our grasp. And, and I, I, you know, I, I do like, you know, you know, the, that, saying that you you stay in control of your own destiny. You don't have to, to rely on another team to help you get into the playoffs. You don't have to rely on another team to help you win your division. Uh, so, you know, everything that, that Dallas set out to do this season is, is, is well within their grasp, is within control of their own performance down the stretch. Uh, has it been a, a tough month? Yes, it has. Uh, you know, as you pointed out, you know, you've lost three out of your last four. You're not playing football as well as you were in October. Uh, and that's a disappointing thing. So, you know, what, what is wrong? What, what, how can we fix this? And you just continue to grind. And then you get into some of the cliche speak where, hey, we're, we're going to flush that game. We're not going to worry about it. We're on to the next opponent. Um, and, and it's frustrating for me because, you know, as a, as a broadcaster, when you get those, those messages from, from the coaches or the players that you have in your production meeting, you, you're looking for some kind of a nugget. You're looking for something that you can work with during the course of the broadcast. But then I'll sit back and reflect and I'll be like, yeah, but – you know, it's a, it's kind of a, an easy way to say all the little things that are going on behind the scenes. So, um, you know, if, if you were to take one, you know, we're on to our next opponent. Well, that, that, that's the easy way of saying everything that you've done to get to that point. You've watched the film, you've looked at what you did well, uh, you, you've made a point of where you struggled a little bit. Um, and, and, and there's so much more that goes into it. So the, the cliches that come out, just for everybody to know that there's a, there's a ton of, of work that's underneath that, that, quick little phrase that coaches and players will throw out there. Um, and, and that's one of the things that, that, that I've kind of, you know, over the years have, have kind of grown to understand when coaches say that. And, and I'll just say, so what you're saying is this. And you say, well, yeah, you understand that part. Um, so I, I know it gets frustrating for us sometimes when we're on the outside, but there's a lot of work being done underneath those cliches. Yeah, uh, very true. Although one that I certainly uh, is loud and clear from Dak today, that's a pissed off group. And hopefully they go into New Orleans uh, angry and they play angry and, you know, come out with a win and try to get things turned around. Daryl, you mentioned and I know we're up against the time law talking to Dick Vermeil today with your new job, uh, an additional job with with Fox, with uh, the USFL, which is is coming back. You're talking to all the coaches and you're seeing all these college coaches right now move Lincoln Riley leaving Oklahoma and going to USC for, if you believe the reports, $110 million, a $6 million home that they're going to buy, all this crazy money in college football. Cliff Kingsbury's name is mentioned for the OU job. And you look at the money that college coaches make versus NFL coaches. At what point do NFL coaches start making college football coaches money across the board? Well, there's a few that are trending that way. Um... You know, I, I think that this has been something that's been going on for a while. I think really, you know, Nick Saban was was kind of the first guy that, that had that opportunity where, uh, you know, early on in his return back to Alabama after he left the Dolphins uh, and then started to have some of that success again. You know, I, I think that, that Nick Saban was probably the highest paid coach in the country uh, in, in the game of football, NFL and, and college football combined. Um, I mean, you mentioned, you know, the contracts to, to Lincoln Riley out in USC, but, but Mel Tucker – at Michigan State, has got a ten-year contract. Um, you know, it, it just it seems to be. I, I get you because you want that consistency, but um, you know, the NFL is a win-now mentality. I, I think for for guys that 
that would be intrigued to come into the college game, you know, dropping down from the professional game. I, I, maybe it's a little bit more job security um, along with the salaries because in the NFL, you may have a contract, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have your whole time there to get that program turned around where I think there's a little bit more patience, you know, at the collegiate level, you know, to stay with some of these coaches. So they, they really haven't gotten to that point yet where the NFL is now. And we've seen it move from, you know, kind of the head coaching position to the potential starting quarterback position where they are no longer waiting, you know, to see if this is going to work over four years, five years. Um, you know, if, if you're not seeing some really positive growth in the direction that, that that organization wants to go at the NFL level in year three, uh, you are definitely on the hot seat. So I, I think that not only the salaries, but maybe some of the stability that's provided at the collegiate level would be a treaty to some of the coaches. Yeah, and then I also look at Cliff. He's got one year left on his deal at Arizona. It's a good way to get that contract extension now, isn't it? Nine and two, and yeah. Oklahoma yeah. wants me. <laughs> yeah, right. A little bit of leverage right there. Hey, just got a phone call from the from the people at Oklahoma. There, they had a pretty good mm -hmm. offer on the table for me. Maybe we maybe we should extend. Uh, yeah, yeah, I like, not, I like right? good and red. You've got the opportunity to use some leverage. Definitely, definitely. That's what it is. Daryl Johnston, the Moose. Always appreciate it, my friend. We'll talk next week. You got it, Jason. Take care. Mondays with the Moose, three-time Super Bowl champion Daryl Johnston as he joins us every Monday to talk some Cowboys and the NFL in, in general.